Hello, and welcome to this talk from the Huddersfield Art Gallery. Um, we actually had to move out of this lovely building uh, just over three years ago and uh, are maintaining a program of, of temporary exhibitions in um, a temporary accommodation. Uh, I will, <coughs> excuse me, at the end of the talk, I will show you one of the architect's visions of what our new art gallery will be like in, we hope, 2027. Um, but in the meantime, we're really pleased to be able to share some of, some of the work from our permanent collection because it's in store and nobody can get to see it at the moment. Um, as an art historian, I, I love that place where personal stories intersect with the grand narratives of art history, where the micro and the macro meet up. Um, a collection like ours, though it's not huge, um, it's possible to tell um, a story with it. And the overarching story today uh, is about how the, in the space of a couple of generations, French painting conquered the British art world. And it's a, a story that I'm going to now try and tell with reference to individual works from our permanent collection. Um, it's partly a story about art education. In the mid-19th century, British art education was at a pretty low ebb. Um, on the one hand, there was the Royal Academy schools, where the great tradition instituted by Sir Joshua Reynolds in the 18th century had uh, deteriorated into a boring, sterile formula. And on the other hand, uh, was the rather utilitarian South Kensington system uh, on offer at the National Art Training School, the, the future Royal College of Art, which existed mostly for the training of teachers and designers. And increasingly, students who wanted something more uh, went to Paris to find the sort of education they couldn't get at home, and then brought the ideas they picked up in the studios and cafes of Paris back to London with them. Uh, the, the French at that time uh, had their version of the Royal Academy schools, the École des Beaux-Arts, uh, but the most popular destination for foreign students was the Academy Julian. Uh, on the advice of his American friend, James Abbott McNeil Whistler, a French painter called Alphonse Le Gros uh, moved to London. Uh, at first, he made a living teaching etching at the National Art Training School. But in 1876, uh, he was appointed to lead the new Slade School of Art in succession to its first head, Edward Pointer. And the Slade um, was a small school um, run by artists for artists and very different to the, the two bigger institutions that I already described. And there, uh, Le Gros spearheaded the import of modern French style art education into Britain. So that was a really important step. Now, these three gentlemen, the stout man sit, sitting on the right hand side of the photo is Philip Wilson Steer. Uh, and he and his friend and exact contemporary, Walter Richard Sickert, uh, we'll come to him in a bit, were both born in 1860 and both died in 1942 uh, and were, so to speak, the Lennon and McCartney of British Impressionism. Steer's first teacher um, had been his father, a portrait painter who taught him to a Revere Turner, uh, but who died when he was only 11. He attended the School of Art at Gloucester, failed to get into the Royal Academy schools, which he later came to think was a lucky escape, um, and then went to Paris. This is also a story about opportunities to exhibit, because you can't build a reputation or make a living if no one can see your work. And the same academic artists who ran the Royal Academy schools in the École des Beaux-Arts uh, controlled access to the annual exhibition at the Royal Academy and the Paris Salon. A uh, bit of history, in 1863, the Salon jury had rejected so many submissions that there was an outcry and a separate exhibition, the Salon des Refusés, uh, 
the Salon of the Rejects was organised uh, to show the rejected work. And it featured work by Whistler and Manet uh, and many others, and welded a fairly disparate crowd of unsuccessful artists into a coherent avant-garde. Uh, one of them, Henri Fantin Latour, wrote later, in the early days, we were refused. We banded together, we shouted, we worked, we grew in number, and they let us pass. So we met each other. We saw who was doing work we liked. We got to know each other. We felt like a crowd, more bold. Uh, it was a really key event. Shortly after Steer returned to London, uh, he and a group of other young French-trained artists whose work was too advanced for the Royal Academy, formed the New English Art Club so that they could show their work together. And the man standing on the left uh, of the photograph is, is Fred Brown. Like Steer, he was a graduate of the Academy Julian and a founder member of the NEAC. In 1892, he succeeded Alphonse Le Gros as Slade Professor and appointed Steer to be his Professor of Painting and Henry Tonks, who combined a surgeon's knowledge of anatomy with impeccable draftsmanship, to be his professor of drawing. Tonks was a brutal critic who often reduced students to tears, and Steer was the opposite of that, and their good cop, bad cop uh, partnership set a seal on, on generations of British students. Uh, both of them worked at the Slade right into the 1930s. Uh, nearly every year for over two decades, Brown and Steer and their, their friend W.C. Coles, the headmaster of Winchester School of Art, and that's him standing at the back, uh, spent part of the summer vacation painting together. They usually went somewhere in England, uh, often following in the footsteps of Turner, uh, Steer always took a copy of the Liber Studiorum with him uh, so that he could keep track of, of what the master had done. Uh, but for some reason, in 1907, they went to Montreuil-sur-Mer in northern France. Uh, now, Frank Brangwyn and some of his students from the London School of Art had taken over the inn in Montreuil. Uh, so the three gentlemen from the photograph uh, took rooms in a house run by a woman called Marie. Uh, this is her in Steer's painting, Quiet Occupation. Um, and clearly one sunny morning, uh, Marie's taken the opportunity to sit in her doorway doing some mending and Steer has set up his easel in the, in the front garden and has painted her. I think looking looking at the painting, I would say that, that he loaded his palette, took up his stance and painted it straight off in one go. Uh, there don't seem to be any sort of afterthoughts, no reworking. Uh, one of the remarkable things about Steer is his capacity uh, in work like this of of being there, an almost zen-like feeling of being sort of in the moment. Uh, he's, he's caught this, just a, a moment in the sunshine and captured it and recorded it for eternity. Um, and I do wonder about, about Steer, this capacity that he had uh, to do that. It, it was, Combined with, I, mean, I, I, I wonder in fact whether he was dyslexic. Uh, he, he never never read, apparently. I uh, hated replying to letters. Uh, and before he went to Gloucester Art College, uh, attended a, a crammer for the civil service, but never even sat the exam because his writing and punctuation was so dreadful that it was clear he, he wouldn't pass. Um, so he, he seems completely focused on this almost preternatural ability uh, to record things, to perceive things visually. Um, he effectively talked with his paintbrush. 
And the biographer Michael Holroyd um, described him as one of the most celebrated artists in the country and one of the worst art teachers in the world, which I think is terribly unfair. Uh, one of his students called Grace Wolf uh, recorded um, what, what the painting, painting studio was like at the Slade. And she said, the door would open slowly for him. Instantly, we all turned to smile, hoping he would come to our end first. If he did, we immediately fetched a high stool. He would sit down and perhaps not speak for five minutes. I well remember one morning I'd put on the model a little old blue shawl, and when Mr. Steer came in, he walked to my stool and looked at the shawl. Then he held out his hand for my palette and brushes. I was very careful always to have the kind he liked and very clean, and he painted for an hour without saying a word. It was a breathless experience. When he rose, I couldn't think how to thank him. He taught much, but said little. And I think that that style of teaching, that sort of non-verbal uh, way of communicating uh, is of, of a piece with his own work. Anyway, after the holiday in montreux sur mer the others returned to London and Steer went on alone to Paris to see the posthumous Cézanne retrospective at the Grand Palais. Uh, so, you know, he was engaged with what was happening uh, on the continent. Uh, I hasten to say this isn't one of our pictures, it belongs to Colchester and Ipswich Museum Service. Um, at the New English Art Club, uh, you know, you had a, a sort of gradations of um, radicalism, fr ranging from the relatively conservative uh, through, through to the very forward looking. Um, and a subgroup of the NA NEAC exhibited in 1888 at the Goupil Art Gallery as the London Impressionists. And this was one of one of Steer's contributions to that exhibition. Uh, and Sickert, who just joined, wrote the catalogue essay. Um, I wanted to show you this because I think it, it hints at Steer's awareness of what was happening on the continent, but his, you know, slight humorous scepticism about it. Um, remember, this exhibition took place in 1888, and 1886 had seen the eighth and final uh, Impressionist exhibition in Paris, uh, which had featured Seurat's Sunday afternoon on Le Grand Jatte. Um, and I do wonder whether the way Steer has painted the pebbles on Warbeswick Beach uh, is a slightly tongue-in-cheek comment on, on pointillism, because I think he would have been interested in, in their theories, probably a little sceptical of them as well. He was an instinctive artist rather than a theoretician. Uh, but he did have, as I already suggested, the visual equivalent of, of perfect pitch. Uh, George Clawson, who painted this, um, another veteran of the Academy, Julian, and founder member of the NEAC, and who'd gone on to be professor of painting at the Royal Academy Schools, years later uh, remembered their days together in, in the NEAC. Uh, my impression at that time was of a man with a lazy mind, but gifted with a wonderful sense of colour. He never made a mistake about that. Since those days, I've come to the conclusion that it was not a lazy mind, but a concentration on the problems of colour, almost to the exclusion of everything else. Uh, Steer worked in a variety of registers. He could do detailed realism, uh, for instance, in the, the muslin dress at the Wiz Williamson Art Gallery and Museum in Birkenhead uh, that Niall Hodson talked about in one of these talks last December. Uh, and if you want to look that up, you can find it on YouTube. Um, and after, after the holiday in Montreuil, he brought sketches and watercolours back to London, painted a big picture, four feet wide, called La Grande Place Montreuil, which is in the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford, uh, and which you can look at, of course, on the Art UK website. Uh, the modernist art critic Roger Fry wrote to him about it in 1918. 
as I know you feel I've sometimes been unjust to your painting, though never consciously so, it's a pleasure to me to tell you how wholeheartedly I admired a landscape of yours, which I came across the other day at Marchand's. It's a great empty place in some French or Belgian town with a great space of sky above. Um, I expect I've seen it before, but it came to me with a new sense of delight, which shows that one grows new perceptions. I thought the relation of the sky to the buildings and the foreground, one of those discoveries of proportion that only very real artists make, and the colour and handling altogether beautiful. Um, we'll come back to steer a bit later on, but now uh, I want to move on a generation. This is one of two paintings from our collection by William Orpen, who was 18 years younger than Steer. Uh, he'd been given a secure grounding in the strict tenets of the South Kensington system at the Metropolitan School of Art in Dublin before coming to London to study at the Slade. Uh, the teachers there didn't only produce students in their own image. Uh, Steer once admitted that he wished he could draw like Orpen, uh, but Orpen clearly belongs in a tradition that isn't solely about Impressionism. Uh, he's a very different sort of artist to Steer and Sickert. Uh, this painting is a commissioned portrait of the daughter of Huddersfield textile magnate Joseph Lum and was painted at his house, Rose Hill, in the north of the town. Um, the year he painted it, in 1906, Orpen travelled to Madrid with the art dealer Hugh Lane to study the paintings of Velázquez at the Prado. And around this time, Velázquez overtook the great artists of the Italian Renaissance as the most admired of the old masters. Um, and you can see Sickert, Steer, Hugh Lane and Henry Tonks in homage to Manet, the group portrait Orpen painted in 1909 at Manchester Art Gallery or on the UK website. Uh, Manet made the pilgrimage to the Prado in 1865 and wrote to his friend Fantin Latour, Velasquez makes the journey worthwhile all by himself. The artists of all the other schools look like shams. He's the supreme artist. Uh, and when The Art of Velasquez uh, by the art critic R.A.M. Stevenson was published in 1895 and reissued in an expanded version four years later, it hailed him as the first Impressionist. And the book was in every art student's pocket. I think looking at the figure of, of Lilo Lum, in this portrait, uh, you can see that you know, if one of her ancestress, ancestresses uh, is the Infanta Margaret Teresa in Velázquez Las Meninas, um, and of course the, the convex mirror in Orphan's painting is certainly a respectful nod to Van Eyck, who included one in the Arnolfini portrait, which he'll have been able to see at the National Gallery when he was a student in London. Mirrors are key to Orpen's work. He was an obsessive self-portraitist, often representing himself in costume, in disguise one might almost say, who thought himself very ugly, though he was very attractive to women. Um, I think he relished the Alice through the looking glass uncanniness of the reflected image and the ambiguity of the picture within a picture. And he certainly enjoyed the opportunity to show how clever he was by getting all those complicated reflections right. Uh, this is another painting not in our collection. This is uh, a Whistler from the Tate Gallery. Uh, and I think you can see if we flip back and forth um, that Lillo's closest relative is uh, Cicely Alexander uh, from Whistler's Harmony in Grey and Green. And Though Whistler died in 1903, he remained an inescapable influence on, on younger artists. Now, after a brief period of study under Le Gros at the Slade in 1881, Sickert had become a pupil and assistant to Whistler, who in 1883 sent him to France to convey his painting of his mother to the Paris Salon. Uh, and there, to Whistler's intense annoyance, he fell under the spell of Digger, uh, and then spent most of next several next several years uh, 
mostly living in France. Uh, from 1898 to 1905, he lived, lived in Dieppe. Uh, and then in 1905 was vis visited by a young artist called Spencer Gore, a contemporary of Orphans from the Slade, whose stories of the London art world so interested Stickett that he decided to come home. Um, on his return, uh, Sickert wrote to another young artist, I particularly believe that I'm sent from heaven to finish all your educations and by ricochet to receive a certain amount of instruction from the younger generation. And um, I think one of the big contrasts between Steer and Sickert is that Steer, uh, he was a, a contented man and he settled down uh, exhibiting at the NEAC, teaching at the Slade, painting in the summer. Uh, and you know, subsided into a life of routine like that. Sickert was a much more restless man, much more uh, restless artist, and never ceased to to move forward, continued developing, uh, and associated increasingly with artists a generation younger than himself. Uh, Gore, who painted this picture on the screen, is one of the great what-ifs of British art history. Uh, he was at the centre of much that happened in the years before the First World War, but in 1914 he got soaked painting outdoors in Richmond Park, developed pneumonia and died, aged, aged only 36. Um, he painted this lovely picture of the Terrace Gardens in Richmond in 1912. Um, and I think you can see from this that uh, he struck a lyrical note that disappeared from English post-impressionism with his death. Um, he was very much a product of the, the Slade. Sickert remembered in the obituary that he wrote uh, that it was a common thing for Gore to recall with pleasure the excellence and rightness of this or that piece of advice or example that he owed individually to each of his teachers. Brown, he would say, taught me such and such a thing very thoroughly. Steer was right when he insisted on this or Tonks on that. Russell's practice was always thus. And his friend, the critic and curator Frank Rutter, suggested that whereas numerous British painters have succeeded in imitating Suzanne superficially, Gore alone in his Richmond pictures found an English equivalent for Suzanne and crystallised his own individual manner of expression. Um, it's a picture that suffers slightly in reproduction. The handling of, of tone and, and colour is so subtle. Um, it really is a shame that you can't all come and see it in the, in the real. It's a very beautiful, unobtrusive work um, and very characteristic of Gore. Uh, his son, Frederick Gore, who was a Royal Academician himself in later years, recalled that for his gentleness, his tact, his sustained enthusiasm, his idealism, his business-like common sense, his eager and entertaining companionship, he was much loved by all who knew him and his diplomatic skills were to be much missed after his death, uh, as things in the bit of the British art, art world that he'd occupied started to get less friendly. Uh, Sickert and Gore and some other friends rented room, rooms at 19 Fitzroy Street where they could store work and show it to invited guests during weekly Saturday at homes. Uh, there was tea and cake and pictures that cost, as they advertised, less than a supper at the Savoy. Uh, one of the other artists who joined this group was Lucien, uh, the eldest son of the father of Impressionism, Camille Pizarro. Uh, born in 1863, uh, Lucien had accompanied his parents when they sheltered in London from the Franco-Prussian War during 1870 to 71 and returned by himself during 1883 to 4. Uh, he was influenced by Seurat and Signac and exhibited with them in the eighth and final Impressionist exhibition in Paris uh, and settled permanently in London in 1890, around which time he met Steer and wrote to his father, 
he divides his tones as we do and is very intelligent. Here is a real artist. Uh, Pizarro's arrival uh, gave the British art scene a new direct link to the Impressionist tradition and he joined the NEAC in 1906. So we're looking at quite a cosmopolitan, uh, knowledgeable group, group of painters. Um, this certainly isn't Little England. An artist whose name is always bracketed with Gores, as Steers is with Sicketts, uh, was Harold Gilman, uh, another member of that astonishing generation at the Slade that had included Gore and Orphan. Uh, and we're lucky to have this, one of his most important paintings. Um, his personality was abrasive, where Gores was diplomatic, uh, and his talent was muscular, where Gores was delicate. Uh, but they complemented one another and were close friends. And 1910, uh, of course, saw the hugely divisive exhibition Manet and the Post-Impressionists, uh, organised by Roger Fry at the Grafton Gallery, which really, it, it caused public scandal and divided the art world into mostly younger artists who were very excited and inspired by it, and mostly older artists who thought it was a bridge too far uh, and dug their heels in. Uh, and a conservative element in the New English Art Club uh, reacted against the post-impressionist influence on the younger generation, and the selection jury of the NEAC began to reject Gilman's work and that of his friends from club exhibitions. Um, and Gilman canvassed everybody and managed to get Sickert on board, even though he was no fan of the post-impressionists. Um, and one of those present remembered later, the result of these numerous conversations was an intimate meeting over dinner at Gatti's. And that evening, the decision after a lengthy discussion was arrived at to form a new society. Gilman was jubilant, and as we had indulged in a good dinner with abundance of wine to wash it down, this was 1911, Sickert, striding out of the restaurant ahead of us, turned and waved his arms, exclaiming, we have just made history. Uh, and thus uh, was, was formed the Camden Town Group, um, an exhibiting society uh, which took over from the NEAC as a focus of the avant-garde and Gore was elected president. And unfortunately, Gilman is another what if of British art history because he died too in the Spanish flu epic pandemic in 1919. So both these wonderful painters, Gore and Gilman, uh, died in late youth, early middle age. And one can only guess at what their later work would have been like if, if they'd lived longer. Uh, both of them lived long enough uh, to leave very wonderful work though. So now, as a sort of postscript, we jump forward nearly 20 years. Uh, this is the only sicket that we have at Huddersfield. And you can't call it a typical sicket, but maybe there's no such thing. Uh, he was such a protean artist, kept on developing and innovating right up to the end of his career. One of relatively few uh, artists in history who've, who've really managed to do that. Um, mostly the innovation gets done at the beginning and then a, a lot of what follows is uh, not re repetition, but artists tend to establish their characters relatively young and then stick with it. Sickert didn't do that. Um, towards the end of his painting life, he grew interested in ephemera and used all sorts of things, including newspaper photographs as source material. Uh, he, did, he did things like, he got interested in the, the pattern created when, when you squared up a drawing to enlarge it onto a canvas and had left that grid in the image. Uh, pursued all sorts of experiments to the extent that contemporary critics uh, sometimes suggested that he completely lost the plot, um, which it's clear with the wisdom of hindsight that he hadn't. 
Um, this is one of the late pictures that, that he called Echoes, uh, and it's based on an, an early 19th century engraving. But you can see he hasn't simply copied it. Um, he's reproduced a lot of the detail in it. But if you look at the detail of his painting, uh, there are patches which are almost abstract, where perhaps uh, a passage in the, in the engraving was unclear. He's just reproduced that uh, lack of clarity. And I, I think it's it's almost postmodern, uh, and certainly anticipates pop art. Um, when they were both old men, uh, Sickert heard that Steer had nearly been run over in the King's Road, um, and sent a telegram: "Please take care. I have no desire to be the greatest living painter." And he wasn't joking, or at least not much. I don't think. He wasn't a modest man. I think he really thought that he and Steer were the two greatest living painters, but he acknowledged the supremacy of his friend. Um, so I hope you're as persuaded as I am that the, the hero of this story is uh, Philip Wilson Steer. Um, so that's the, the end of what I had prepared to say. Um, Oh, I promised to show you what our new home will look like in a few years. Uh, and you can see our, our old home is uh, the building on the right with a, a new modern extension built on the back. Uh, the new art gallery uh, is the complex on the, the left of the photograph. Um, and I can't say how much I'm looking forward to moving into it and seeing the permanent collection again. Okay. Thank you very much for listening. Um, and uh, put 2027 in your diary and come and visit us.